I don't know about you, but I am grateful to be here this morning. I don't know about you, but I am grateful to be alive. I don't know about you, but I am thankful. I have the heart of a thanksgiver. And, I, and if there's anyone here with the heart of a thanksgiver, begin to praise God this morning and say, God, I'm not where I used to be. Because of your grace and your mercy, I'm not where I used to be. I thank you, Lord, that I am alive this day. I thank you that I am a part of this season. I'm, many lost their lives in the COVID. Many went through stuff. If I go to the hospitals now, there are many people in hospitals, but you and I can gather in his presence this morning. And so we just want to lift up our hands and say, God, thank you. I am so thankful, Lord. I'm, I may not be where I want to be. I may not have received the things that I want, but I am thankful, Lord. I thank you, Lord. Every day that I'm alive is a day to give God praise. And we worship you in this building, Lord. We glorify you. And may your name be glorified. Somebody praise God so much so that the enemy will begin to give up on you. Praise God so much so that the devil will begin to give up on you. And praise God so much so that your enemies can begin to hear it and, and say that, yes, indeed, he is a God. Father, we bless you and we thank you in Jesus' mighty name. Hallelujah. We can take our seat in the presence of God. I just want to say a big thank you to the visionaries of this house, Pastor Gary and Pastor Lorita, for asking me to preach. I also want to extend a welcome and a big thank you to all the leadership in the house. I could not mention names because there's lots of leaders in the house. So I just want to say thank you very much for being here. And I want to say a big thank you to everyone that is here to listen to the word of God this morning. And I pray that at the end of it, something will begin to stir up in your spirit. I pray that at the end of it, you are going to walk away with something. I pray that at the end of the word, you are going to walk out empowered, encouraged, motivated, and inspired to do something for the kingdom in the mighty name of Jesus. Beloved, my word for today, I have themed it be immovable. Be immovable. And my text is taken from 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verse 58. 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verse 58. And it goes, it says, Therefore, my brothers, my beloved brothers, brothers and sisters. Be steadfast and immovable, always excelling in the work of the Lord, always excelling in the word of the Lord. Another translation says, be continually aware that your labor in the Lord is not futile nor wasted. Therefore, brothers and sisters, be steadfast, immovable, always excelling in the work of the Lord. We are told to be steadfast and immovable. Beloved, to be immovable is to be firmly planted in a place. Um, to be immovable is to be stable even when all hell is breaking loose. Um, to be immovable is to remain um, remain at all costs even when others are given up. Um, when others are given up on the gospel and others are given up on a place, you decide that you are going to remain immovable. Um, to be immovable is to be remain even in the face of adversity. Um, to be immovable is to believe even when you cannot see. Um, because there are times when we cannot see but we still have to focus on God. Um, we still have to remain because God told me to remain. Even though I cannot see why God says I must remain, I will remain in this place. And that is a person that is immovable because they are not moved by what is happening in the environment. They are not moved by what the situation is in their life. They are not moved because others are saying that there is, there is food in Egypt. I am going to stay because God says I must stay. And we are told in the Bible about Isaac. We were told that a time came in that when he was living in Greece in the land of the Philistines and we are told that there was famine in the land and everyone was beginning to transition and go into Egypt because they have had word that there was food in Egypt and so they were going and God said to Isaac you will not go but you will remain in this land and you will sow in this land and we are told that he stayed how many of us that when God says stay we are looking at the environment and saying but God there is a famine God this and that is happening how can I stay but to be immovable is to listen to the voice of God God, and the voice of God alone. And even when I cannot see and I cannot touch and I cannot feel, Lord, and I cannot hear it, Lord, I refuse to be immovable. I will remain. And to be immovable is to maintain your confession at all times. And beloved, there are times when we say there is a going up and, and the many things begin to change and we change our confession. And some of us change our confession based on the environment in which we are. And because things are good, we
we are saying yes it is good when things become bad we begin to say things are bad but to remain immovable is to say that I'm not controlled by my environment I will not change my confession based on my environment I will speak what God says and even though I cannot see I cannot hear I cannot touch it I refuse to change my confession to be immovable is to refuse to give up or to throw in the towel to be immovable is to say that I am total I totally surrender everything to God to be immovable beloved is to say I place my trust in God my hope is in God and everything that God says is what goes to be immovable beloved is to be like Ruth we know in Ruth chapter 1 verse 16 and she said to Naomi wherever you go I will go and where you stay I will stay your people will be my people and your God will be my God I don't want to assume that anybody everybody knows that story but we are told that a certain woman moved into a land with her husband and she lost her husband and the two sons and the two sons had gotten married to these two women and Opa and, and, and Ruth and we are told that a time came when Naomi heard that there was food but God had blessed the very land that she had left and she decided that she was going to go back and she said to her two daughters-in-law my sons that you were married to are now dead and gone and I've got to go back to my land that God has called me back to I released the two of you to go and one of them kissed the mother-in-law and said goodbye and left the second one says that I will go with you I am immovable I'm married into this family for good and for bad I'm in this family and so that is when she said to her mother-in-law that wherever you go I will go and where you stay is where I will stay and your people will be my people and your God will be my God beloved that is what God calls us to and that is what being immovable and steadfast is all about and even though the very thing that you came for no longer exists and even though the very thing that attracted you to a place no longer exists and but so far as God says I have planted you in this place you begin to remain in that place and to be immovable is to be like Mary Magdalene and we know the story of Mary Magdalene we know that Mary Magdalene was one of the women that was possessed by seven demons and, and after Jesus casted out those demons she was immovable she remained with Jesus and she remained she was one of the three people that could be found at the cross and even when Jesus died and when his very disciples had rejected and given up on him and they had left him, she was one of the three Marys that remained at the cross and, and we see that she was the one of the three she was the one that Jesus revealed himself to she refused to be immovable and even though her life was at risk and Peter and every Everyone else had scattered and gone into hiding them but she removed she refused to move them and she remained there at all times and she was immovable to be immovable beloved is to be like Hannah we know that the, if you know the story about Hannah we are told that a certain woman was married to her Elkanah and her husband had another wife who, who was Penaniah but we are told that Hannah's womb was shut and could not have a child and every time they went to the temple to go and pray at the end of the year oh her rival kept kept saying words against her but we know that Hannah refused to be removable she was so immovable she continued to go year in and year out and she continued to go into the presence of God and she continued to pray and demand them to the point where Eli thought that she was she, she was actually drunk because we are told that one day she was crying and she was in the spirit that much and that he said to her are you drunk and she says I'm not my heart is in anguish she refused to be immovable and we know the end of that story and God came through for her because God looked at her commitment he looked at her dedication and he looked at her conviction and heaven was pregnant at the time and heaven, heaven needed someone to bear forth a prophet and, and she was also needing a son and, and she was able to connect with heaven and, and to be able to bear that which heaven was wanting to do in the earth realm and, but the reason for which she was able to do that is because she was immovable in her faith and, in the mighty name of Jesus hallelujah somebody shout hallelujah to God right now in the name of Jesus and Father Lord we thank you Hannah was immovable she refused to allow the taunting of Penaniah stop her from having a child and she refused to allow the comment of Eli that she was drunk to stop her from praying and she refused to remain barren and she came into alignment with the heaven and she was able to bring forth the very prophet judge and high priest that heaven was in need of 
to be immovable is to be like Job. Beloved, we know that Job suffered. Oh, Job, we are told that Job was told in the one day that your ten children have all died. And he was told in the same very day that you have lost everything that you have. He was an outstanding member of the society and everybody came to him. He sat at the gates and people came to him. He was an elder in the community. He was a, a, a well-standing elder in the community. But we are told that the enemy seek permission from God and began to touch everything that Job had. And in one day, he lost it all. But we know the story. If you know the story about Job, we know that Job on the day, the very day that you were told that my, your ten children have died, and you have lost all your oxen, your cattle, begin to picture that image. But we see Job go down on his knees and, and begin to worship God. Because I am immovable in my faith. It is not about the cattle that I have. It is not about the cars that I have. It is not about the money that I have. It is not about the things that I have. It is not about the children that I have. Before all of these things came into my life, there was a God, there is a God, and there will always be a God. And therefore, I will go down on my knees and give this God a praise in the mighty name of Jesus. Hallelujah. 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 Even when the devil came this time and asked for permission to touch his very skin and his very life. And we are told that he became an eyesore to the point where his wife said, why don't you just curse God and die? I don't know why you are still remaining. It is one thing for me to lose my children. It is one thing for me to lose my lifestyle. It is one thing for me to lose my social standing. It is one thing for me to lose my position. It is one thing for me to become an eyesore. It is one thing for me to be pitied but it is another thing for me to see a husband who is ridden with sore sat outside and everyone castigating him I cannot live with this why don't you just curse God and die but he refused to curse God and die that is being immovable in your faith and so we know that he didn't and for those of you that have read the story to the very end we know that God came through for him because of his immovable faith because of his immovable character because of his immovable personality and he, we know that God came through and this time God gave him a double portion of everything that he lost and that is the reward of being immovable in the name of Jesus beloved this is the backdrop of my text be steadfast and immovable hallelujah but before I go in I just want to take a minute out and acknowledge that yes we have suffered yes we are suffering yes we go through stuff because sometimes as preachers we bring the praise report and as preachers we come and tell you be steadfast and we don't want to acknowledge the very problems that we are all going through and we don't want to acknowledge the very struggles that we are all going through and we don't want to acknowledge how difficult day by day life can be but I I've come today to say it is hard and I know that life can be hard and I know that sometimes dealing with a child with mental health can be hard dealing with a child in crisis or dealing with a marital crisis and dealing with issues in life when you don't know where you are going or coming when dealing with immigration problems and dealing with, with job situations it can be hard and so I just want to acknowledge with you I don't just want to give you that steadfast part but I want to acknowledge that yes Yes, it is real. Our struggle is real. Not finding the job is real. Praying for a husband for years and it is not coming, it is real. Praying for a wife for years and it is not coming, it is real. Praying for that child for years and say, God, I have been immovable and I have been faithful and I have served you diligently and I am doing everything and it is not coming can be real. And I want to acknowledge that yes, it is real. We will no longer sweep it under the carpet, but we will say, God, in my struggles and in my, in my persistence and I pray that you give me the faith to remain and I pray that you increase my measure of faith and because I am going through a turbulent time and, and I am going through a difficult time and, and I am going through an impossible time and, and sometimes when you are in the midst of a crisis it can look as if it is prolonged it may just be for, for a few months but it sometimes it feels a lifelong time and, and we are praying that God will help us to be able to overcome the confusion and the, the fear that we experience and the backsliding and, and the questions that we have got because I believe that many of us in this season some of us that
that have stayed away from church and some of us that are even sat in the church and we've got multiple questions to ask God but God why did this happen how did you allow this to happen why should this be happening to me I have served you diligently for two years for three years for ten years for twenty years and I am struggling where is the God of the Bible and where is the God of the good times and where is the promises that God made to me and where is the vision that God gave me and why has it not happened and why is it not happening and why have I got to go through this pain and why do I feel rejected and isolated and denied him oh why am I going through all of these things and I want to acknowledge that it is real and I want to acknowledge that your feelings and emotions are real and we are all together in this because the Word of God tells us in Ecclesiastes chapter 3 verse 1 it says to everything there is a season and to every time and everything there's a season for every time to every purpose and every everything under the Sun there's a time to be born and there's a time to die there's a time to be planted and there's a time to have them there's a time to heal and there's a time to be sick there's a time to have a breakdown there's a time to build up there's a time to weep and there's a time to laughing there's a time to mourning and there's a time to dancing and so we are gonna go through season being a child of God does not mean that we will not go through seasons being a child of God does not mean you no longer face rejection being a child of God or coming into Christ is the beginning of a lot of challenges because when you are in the world the devil doesn't want to know you but the minute you begin to confess and profess Jesus as your Lord and personal Savior all hell begins to break loose and the devil comes against you like a flood but I want to let you know there is a time and a season God says that everything under this this sun has a time and a season and my word to you today is this one too shall pass in the name of Jesus it will pass 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 in the name of Jesus let every problem in this place Lord and let it pass Lord and those that have been in crisis for a long time Lord and I am praying that it will pass but it says therefore beloved brothers and sisters be steadfast and immovable and always excelling in the work of the Lord and in despite everything that you are going through him God is saying hold tight brace yourself him he says travel persevere push yourself him because it will pass this one is also in your purpose this is also in your lifeline but it will pass before gold becomes gold it will go through the fire before you can ascend to the heights that you've got to go through you will go through setting pressing and setting pushing and setting tri tribulation and setting trials but this one too shall pass and brace yourself hold yourself strengthen yourself and say God help me equip me empower me push me through and because this one too it shall pass be immovable because if you are not, you are not on your own. That is why you've got to be immovable. Be immovable because Jesus is in the seasons with you. We are told of the story of the disciples where Jesus said to the disciples in Mark and says that get into the boat and we will go to the other side. And we are told that Jesus went to the bottom of the ship, the boat, and he was sleeping and the storm came and they began to shout and say, Jesus, do you not care that you be perished? How can you say do you not care that we perish when Jesus is in the boat, the miracle worker is in the boat, the one that you have experienced and sat under his ministry and seen all kinds of miracles happening and they are questioning that Jesus do you not care that I am in the boat. I've come to tell someone that in your boat you may not be able to see Jesus but he is in the boat with you. Somebody shout to yourself he is in my boat with me. He is in my boat with me. He is in my boat with me him he is in my boat with me him he is in my boat with me him the disciples saw Jesus in person but yet they could not recognize the, the, the ability that would the power that was in the boat with them how much more you and I that serve an invisible God and it can even be more difficult and but I've come to assure someone today that Jesus is in your boat with you him don't take the crisis as just your crisis him don't take the isolation as just yours him don't take the problem as just yours because Jesus is in the boat with you and he is in the boat and we know the story that when Jesus was awoken and he said do you not care that we perish master and Jesus spoke to the wind and he spoke to the storm and the storm was still and so I've come to tell you that any storm that you find yourself in any crisis that you may have found yourself in Jesus is in the boat he is in the boat 
and the reason is he's in the boat is to ensure that that, that storm will not overwhelm you oh I get that well the storm cannot and will not he will never give me much more than I can bear whatever you are going through you are far capable far able to get through it anything that you are going through you are far capable of going through stop looking to the left and stop looking to the right and and who is going through what and who is going through that because if you want to focus on what other people are doing you may not be able to go through your storm but this is my storm this is my storm and I've got Jesus in my boat and my focus is gonna be on Jesus and that is why Isaac was able to remain everyone was going out of grief there was farming and everyone else was going but we are told that he remained in the storm he remained in the farming condition and he was able to reap a hundredfold so if you know that Jesus is in your storm and you allow him the thing is some of us don't recognize he's there we don't give him preeminence for that we don't consult him about the storm we don't acknowledge him about the storm and that is why the storm is never ending you seem to be in the storm but I recognize you Jesus that you are the one in the storm with me and we are told that Shadrach, Meshach and Abednego they were put in the fire the king has said this should be put in the fire they saw three people people put in the fire but we are told that later on they saw a fourth person in the fire with them and so Jesus was in it with them that is how our life is Jesus is always in the storm with us and allow him to be the fourth one those men were immovable in their faith and they said if you will put us in put us in I serve a God whose name is yea and amen I serve a God who is the I am that I am God if I perish I perish him if I he saves me he saves me and I'm not going to change my confession and my faith is immovable and it is what it is and you got to do what you got to do and I've got to do what I'm gonna do and so you put us in him and we see that the three men are put in him the very person that put them in him died him but yet there was a fourth man and in the fire with them him that is how much God is about to do for you him that is how much God wants to do for you him he says I am in the storm and I will be in the fire and I am in the crisis with you and in the mighty name of Jesus hallelujah hallelujah we know that Jesus was able to calm the storm beloved Isaiah chapter 41 verse 10 to 14 it says that do not be afraid for I am with you don't be discouraged for I am your God to be afraid is the feeling of fear anxiety of being frightened that is what fear that is what being afraid is and we know the acronyms for it is false evidence appearing real false evidence appearing real the devil makes it look that it is real he makes it look like your world is really falling apart but with God on your side with God in your boat with God in your in your boat and your storm and your wilderness for you it is impossible for you to be afraid it is impossible that is why he says do not be afraid for I am with you don't be discouraged for I am with you I am your God him he says don't be afraid I am with you then he says don't be discouraged don't even entertain discouragement not just be afraid don't even entertain discouragement many of us get discouraged we get discouraged because you plow in and what you plow back out is not equivalent to what you put in him input is not equal output him. and you have been putting in and you have been putting in him, and you get to a point where you are discouraged him, because my efforts are yielding nothing him. but God is saying do not be afraid him. and he said do not be discouraged him. not just the fear but don't even entertain discouragement in your life him. because I am your God him, in the mighty name of Jesus Beloved, the same zeal that we started when we accepted Jesus as our Lord and personal Savior. It is the same zeal that we must walk through life with. I know life has defined what life should be for us and we come from a community that tells us that when you are 30 you must be married and when you are 20 you must be married or your brothers and sisters this happened for them and this happened for that person and that person had a child here and this person had a job here and this person did this and but your life is different and God would defy earthly laws for you we know that we know in the in the Bible that Sarah's life was different she gave birth at 90 and that may not be your story and 
I don't have to focus on what is happening with Joe Blocks down the line. And what is happening with me? What does God want to do with me? What is the word of God for me? What is the promises of God for me? Let us stop looking to the left and the right and looking at what people are doing and stop concentrating on what people are saying about us and say, I give it all to God in his own time, in his own time, he will do exceedingly abundantly more than I can ever wish for in the name of Jesus. First Samuel chapter 12 verse 22 the Lord will not abandon his people because it will dishonor his great name for it pleases the Lord to make him his very own the Lord will not abandon you he will not abandon his people because it will dishonor his great name God will not abandon you if we are experiencing abandonment it's because we have abandoned ourselves and how can I abandon myself? It's by not following the word of God and the will of God. He says, it is not in my nature. It cannot be in my nature. It will dishonor and discredit my very name. And so I will not abandon you. It is not in my nature. Uh, you, you will experience all the negative emotions and pains and anxiety and concerns. And it, it may feel real, but I will not abandon you. And we have a God who is with us and, and who will bring us through. Him. Uh, David said, yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow, of death and I will fear no evil for thou art with me and your rod and your staff they comfort me yea though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death there is a valley of shadow of death that from time to time you and I will walk through and David is saying yea though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death I will fear no evil I will not be afraid I've got a God who is bigger than any spirit in this world beloved it is real we wrestle not against flesh and blood but we wrestle against principles politics and powers and demonic but we have a father who is greater than all of these we have a God who is more powerful than all of these and so we've got to stop being afraid of them and say Lord I am walking through the valley of the shadow of death but I refuse to fear all evil because I know that you are with me your rod and your staff they will comfort me because there are times when God will cover you and there's a time that God will whip you back into shape and there are times when God will correct you that time when God will tell you often that times when he will the same person will wrap his arms around you and say thou faithful child get on with it in the name of Jesus hallelujah Joseph was immovable in his faith we are told that Joseph had a dream and God has spoken to him about what he was going to make him into Joseph decided to go a little bit ahead of God and begin to reveal what God was about to do in his life. And we know that his brothers then got envious of him and they sold him off into slavery. So we know that he was sold off. Initially they wanted to kill him and then they decided we will sell. One of them decided let us sell him off. And so they sold him off into slavery in Egypt. And we know that he was bought by a man called Potiphar who was one of the workers of the king Pharaoh. And we know that he worked in the house. But he was a man of faith. And, and the men the minute Joseph entered that house everything began to change in the house because he carried the presence of God he carried the power of God and I want to say take a minute out to say you carry the presence of God you carry the power of God and so when you step into a situation a situation is going to give way for you if a situation is not giving way for you it's because you are not exercising the very power that God has given you many of us step into a situation and we forget who we are we forget whose we are we forget the power that is within us we forget the anointing that we carry on our head and you allow the devil to slap you from left to right but the time comes when you rise up and say devil enough is enough oh I carry the power of God in me and it says that at the mention of the name of Jesus every knee has got to bow and every tongue has got to confess and so devil you've got to get out of here Jesus said to Peter you devil get behind me and the time comes when you literally have to say devil get thee behind me I have suffered this for too long I have entertained this for too long I have accepted this for too long but I command you to get D behind me in the name of Jesus and so we know that Joseph was taken to the house of Potiphar and he was in the house of Potiphar and everything began to change because we realized that Potiphar's life began to improve everything business wise was expanding and everything to the point where he acknowledged the, the anointing that was over this Hebrew foreign boy that was in his house he recognized it sometimes the reason why the devil is against you is because he recognized the anointing that you carry him the reason why the devil is against you he recognized the ability that is on you 
The reason why the devil is after you and I, he recognized the power that God has placed in you. And so he comes against you and we roll over and give in to him. He is only intimidated by what you carry. Begin to arise up and exercise that which you carry. And so we see that there's a change happening in the house of Potiphar and everything begins to change and improve in his house. And he gives everything in the command of Joseph apart from his wife. But the enemy rose up against him. The enemy knew the anointing that he carried. The enemy knew what God was about to do in the land. The enemy knew what was about to happen. Sometimes the devil can preempt some of the things that he thinks is going to happen. He sees the trajectory that God has placed you on. He sees the journey that God has placed you on. And he can begin to project that if you continue this way, in five, ten years time by now, you will become the head of this and you will become. And so he decides to sow seeds from an a very early stage um, to begin to derail you. So we see that in the wife of Potiphar, she begins to go against, uh, against Joseph, go after him. And when she was not successful in having her sleep with her, uh, with her she told a lie and he was chucked into prison. But I want you to know that God is always working for you in the prison, in the hospital, in a trial, whatever situation, whatever crisis that the enemy puts you through. Huh? God is working for you because God is with you. You take God everywhere you go. Sometimes we believe that when we are in a storm, God is not there. Huh? But God is there and there is no experience that is wasted in the name of Jesus. And God used that very difficult and painful experience to promote Joseph because we know that God God caused a certain king of the land to begin to have dreams that no one in the land was able to interpret the dream and so Joseph was the one that had to interpret the dream. I want you to know that what God has called you to, no one can do it better than you. What God has called you to, no one can do it as effective as you. The purpose that God has over you, stop looking for someone else to be you and arise up and be you. God has given each and every one of us an assignment and a purpose to fulfilled in this earth realm and no one can do a better Trudy than me and no one can do a better Denise than sister Di Dickness Denise and no one can do a better sister Diane than sister Diane so I rise up and as I speak over you and whatever stirring that God has caused in, the, in your belly and may you be equipped and arise up in the name of Jesus and, and begin to say God I'm not playing church anymore and I'm not just gonna sit there anymore and I'm not just gonna rest anymore and because people don't want to accommodate me and people don't want to make room for me but I am arising up and I believe that the Holy Spirit has made room for me and I will proceed further in the name of Jesus Joseph was the one to interpret the dream and all the magicians and all the wise men and any kind of religion they all came and no one could interpret it and it took Joseph having to be brought out of prison to come and interpret the dream because God made room for him and he was immovable the young boy was immovable even though he was in prison he was immovable he was in a foreign land he was immovable he was living in Potiphar's house he was immovable his sleeping with Potiphar's wife would have made life a little bit easier for him but he was immovable he refused he refused to do that which was wrong and he removed remained steadfast and immovable in his faith hallelujah and we know the story and how the story ended for Joseph and things became glorious for him and he was promoted in a very foreign land and all oh, that God had taken him to the enemy thought he was taking him out to kill him and to destroy him and, and to waste him away but God said that I will allow you Satan because as you do this and you are taking him closer to destiny and I will allow you because you are pushing him closer to purpose and I will allow you because you are pushing him closer to greatness and I've come to tell someone and that your problems are taking you closer to greatness and your enemies are pushing you closer to greatness and what the devil is doing to you and it may look like him or hell is breaking loose and but it is pushing you further and it is refining you and it is purifying you and it is lifting you up and into greatness in the name of Jesus hallelujah hallelujah Oh yes, he was lifted up. He was lifted up, he was lifted up, he was lifted up. And so would you be lifted up in the name of Jesus. Even though you are immovable, God is working on you, for you. Even though I am immovable, God is working on me, for me. 
Isaac was immovable. He stayed, but God was working on him, for him, giving him a harvest of a hundredfold. Even though Hannah was immovable, God was working on her, and he gave her a child. She was able to help heaven fulfill the destiny. Even though you were immovable, God was working on you, for you. Joseph was immovable in his faith. He could have done anything his own way, but he chose to be immovable and remain steadfast in the things of God, and God went beyond him and did a thing for him. When you stop moving, you give God permission to move. Your, your immovability allows God to move on your behalf. Your being immovable allows God to move you from one dimension to the next. Be immovable allows God to work on your behalf in the name of Jesus. God will move others for you, beloved. God will move situations for you. God will withhold certain things from other people because you remain immovable. God will silence demonic powers for you. Oh, God will silence magicians and, and, and ethnic kings because of you. He will move people out of position because of you. Because we realize in the story of Joseph, they were looking for someone who could be in command in all of Egypt and be second in command under the king at the time. And they found no one. The king says, I will choose Joseph. He was the only one who could tell me about the dream. He's the only one with the vision to be able to carry out the dream. And so God silenced anyone else. Anyone who was waiting in Egypt, any Egyptian that was waiting to come in power at the time, they were removed because I tell you, he was a, he was a foreign hero, Hebrew boy that had been brought into a foreign land. And that is what God can do for you. I want to speak over anyone that is experiencing immigration situations and immigration challenges. God says that wherever the soul of your feet shall thread, I will give it to you in the name of Jesus. And I need you to prophesy that over yourself every day you wake up. You step on the ground and say, God, I'm in the United Kingdom right now. I'm in America right now. I'm in Africa right now. And I take authority and I take possession of the very place that my feet have thread. Because that is what the power of God does. We see God change legislation for Joseph. We see God change the jurisdiction for Joseph. We see God change everything um, because of Joseph. Uh, he was a Hebrew boy. Uh, he was a foreign boy. Um, and he was in the land of Egypt. But how can I rise up, Lord, um, from that position to a position, a high position, as in he, he was placed in and given the king's daughter to marry on top? God will reward you, beloved. You think it is impossible, but I've come to challenge the mind of someone that it is possible. Um, it is possible. It is possible. It is possible. You have heard too long that it is possible. Impossible. The doctors have said it is impossible. The lawyers have said it is impossible. Everyone around you is saying it is impossible. Um, but I need someone to be like the woman with the issue of blood um, and say, yes, the crowd um, is all around me um, and it looks like it is impossible um, and I can't get through. Um, I have tried for 12 years. Um, I have lost everything that I have. Um, all my money are gone and the doctors can do nothing for me. Um, but I will press through anyway um, because I, I will believe that with this man um, in this city, and at this time my life is about to change and we know she pressed through him and she touched him and Jesus said the virtue has left me and she was made whole I'm looking for a blind Bartimaeus in the house that is saying that even though the crowd is saying shut up I refuse to shut up I will continue to scream and I will continue to shout until Jesus looks this way until his attention is on me I have heard too many stories about this Jesus I have heard too many things about this Jesus I refuse to remain silent I refuse to suffer I refuse to remain where I am I give my life to him Jesus thou son of David, um, where are you? Um, come into my life um, and come and change things around him. Um, and we know that he regained his sight um, because he was about to, he was able to gain the attention of Jesus. The Bible tells us of a certain woman from Sidon um, and we are told that Jesus had gone into Sidon and Tushas um, and nothing, no miracle was recorded. Um, when he went to Sidon and Tushas there was no miracle. It was a foreign land um, and nothing had happened. Um, and when Jesus was just led to Tushas and Sidon, a certain woman came to him. Um, she was a Samarian woman. Um, she was a Gentile. Um, she didn't have the power. She didn't have the connection. Um, she did not have the birthright. Um, she was not an Israelite. Um, but the woman 
woman came to Jesus and said, Jesus, my daughter, she is unwell and I need you. And Jesus was silent and the disciples began to say, send her away. She is disturbing us. Send her away. And the funny thing is she was not even talking to them. But they were saying, send her away. She is being noisy. Many are saying you are being noisy. Many are saying you are praying too much. Many are saying you are following a God who does not work. But I've come to tell you, be immovable. My position is my position. I trust this God. I will follow this God until my dying day. And I will be immovable. Because that woman was immovable. She remained. Even when Jesus himself turned around and he said to her, I cannot give the food of the children to you. She says, even dogs eat crumbs, Lord. Even the dogs will eat crumbs. God, I want to say that even the dogs eat crumbs, Lord. Oh, in the name of Jesus, Lord. Dogs eat crumbs. I will remain for the crumbs, Lord. Who is remaining for the crumbs? Who wants to stay back for the crumbs? Because I refuse to go, Lord. I refuse to accept the situation. I refuse to remain here, Lord, and not fulfill destiny and not fulfill purpose. I refuse, Lord, to let the enemy continue to toss me about. I refuse to go home to a sick child, Lord. I refuse to go home to pleading in the name of Jesus. I refuse to be picked up from here and taken back home and brought back every day to sit outside here to come and beg. I will shout, Jesus, thou son of David, where are you? Come and Jesus gave him his sight in the name of Jesus. Jesus gave the crumbs to the woman and she went back home and her daughter was healed in the mighty name of Jesus. Father Lord, we thank you. Oh, we thank you. I don't have to move because I have a God who moves for me. He moves policies for me. He moves laws for me. He moves legislations for me. He moves governments for me. He will move leaders for me. God will change rules because of you. I remember a certain year when my kids were seven years old. God changed immigration because of me. I call it a praise to him. I'd been waiting for years and I'd been waiting for nine years and I had done everything that I could and I had spent every money that I possibly could and I got to the point where I said, I'm doing this no more, Lord. I'm in that 33 thousand pounds in debt and from one lawyer to the next but I will do nothing anymore and for two years I refused to do anything and a year came and God changed the rules I got a phone call from the lawyer and he says the rules have changed I don't even need your money I will tell you what paperwork to fill out and go and sort out your paperwork God will change rules for you he will change legislation he will change government he will change molecular structure for you he will change composition position of your body for it to begin to do something. He changed it. We, we, when you look at the story of, 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 of Sariah, Sariah was 90 years old. And everything had shriveled up. And her womb was shut down. And she was in full blown. She had even passed menopause and, and nothing could happen. But God was able to change the composition of her body for it to carry a seed in the mighty name of Jesus. And that seed goes on to be the father of nations, the mother of nations. Come on now. God can change anything for you. God can change every report for you. God can change the statistics for you. Um, some of us find ourselves in the statistics of this world. Um, our sons are in the statistics of this world. Um, oh, black sons. Um, oh, you the statistics and the odds are against you. Um, oh, you cannot amount to much. You cannot do much. Um, but I've come to tell anyone with a black son in the room um, that your son is not part of any statistic. Um, your son is going to break the statistics. Um, your son and your daughters are going to be an anomaly. Um, your sons and your daughters um, are going to go on and be become astronauts and engineers and, and whatever God has said over them. It is not about the system. It is not about the statistics. It cannot be wherever you are. Begin to decree and declare over your children that my children will be everything that God says they will be. Devil, you are a liar. It is impossible. It is impossible. It may be played before my very eyes, but I refuse and I reject the very things that I'm seeing because in the realm of the spirit, I see a prince. I see a great one. I see government. I see leadership. I see astronauts. And that is what I see. And let it be so for my sons and my daughters in a foreign land. In Jesus' mighty name. Disciples were in a boat with Jesus. He didn't have to do anything. He decided to shout. And say, do you not care? to tell somebody today, 
Jesus is in your boat. Begin to ask the right questions. A lot of us are not asking the right questions. We are asking the very wrong questions. You've got Jesus in your boat and you are asking the very wrong questions. Begin to ask Jesus the right person. I've got this child in this marriage, in this crisis, in this job situation, in this business, in this ministry. What are we doing, Lord? What are we doing? What are we doing? What are we doing? Because it is the will of God. You should be in the will of God. If I am in the will of God, everything that God says will be. Begin to ask God the right questions about the very situation that you are in. And not be shouting and say, God, do you not care that my husband is walking out or my wife is walking out? Do you not care that my son is going wayward? And you were asking the question, Father, this son is your son. This daughter is your daughter. What are we going to do, Lord? What are we going to do about the situation? What do you want me to do about the situation with you? It is your responsibility, Lord, just as my responsibility. And what are we about to do about the situation? I'm to encourage you to stop shouting and begin to ask God the right questions. I want to conclude with a story about Elisha and Elijah, which can be found in 2 Kings chapter 2, verse 1 to 12. We are told that on the time had come where God was about to take Elijah up, and he was walking with Elisha. And Elisha said, Elijah said to Elisha, stay where you are, because God says I should go off. I think he was to Gilgal. He says, as long as God remain, I'm coming with you. And so he follows him to Gilgal. They get to Gilgal. I think he says that God has asked me to go to Bethel. You stay here. He says, as long as the Lord remain, I am immovable. I am coming with you. I was made your protege for a reason, and I am coming with you. And we know that they go to Bethel together. They get to Bethel. He says that God says, I must go to Jericho. Um, because God is testing your faith and my faith every step of the way every step of the way you think that you passed the test once and so tomorrow it is all right he is testing because he wants before God will entrust nations and kingdoms and organizations and ministries into your hands he wants to test your character what are you going to be who are you going to be when I bless you with such an abundant blessing are you going to become a storehouse or are you going to become a channel of blessing for him to give you that cooperation you've got to be a channel of blessing because when God gives you anything he gives it for the good of humanity not Christianity but humanity so God wants to trust you with whatever he gives so he keeps testing you he gives you a little bit more but some of us when you get a blessing and then we walk away from God because I have arrived I've got the husband now God I'm busy with the husband I've got the wife now but God I'm busy with the wife I've got that child now but God you know I'm busy my child needs me more and then we walk away from the very blessing it was just the starting point dear it was just the beginning God is about to do exceedingly abundantly more than ever you can ever think of which he says that what he's about to do eyes have not seen ears have not heard neither has it entered into the hearts of men so if you have seen it there is more coming if others have heard it, there is better coming. If others have seen it and entered into the heart, there is more. Because he says, what I'm about to do, it has not been seen by anyone. It has not been heard by anyone. It has not entered the heart of anyone. So what God is about to do in your life, don't think what you are now is it. There is more that God is about to do. And so we see that we, we see when they when they get to Jericho, and then and then Elijah, Elijah says to Elijah, You wait here. He says, No, I'm not. As long as the Lord lives, I am coming. And what I don't understand is, at the time when they were going, at every stop, there were a group of prophets there who were saying to Elisha, do you know your master is about to be taken today? They were not traveling the distance. And then he says, oh, keep quiet, I know, but keep quiet, say nothing. And then he goes, and they stay behind. So some of them remain at, at, at Gilgal, some of them remain at Bethel, some of them remain at Jericho. They didn't go. But he was the faithful one. He was the immovable one. And we are told that when they got and they were about to cross the Jordan, he said to him, what do you want from me? Elijah, Elijah realized that Elisha has stood the test of time. He has remained steadfast and immovable. There's got to be a reward. And so he said to him, what do you want? He says, I want a double portion of the anointing that you carry. I don't want what you carry. What you carry is for you. But I want mine. But mine has got to be a double portion of you. I thought, come on now, he's very brave to be asking your mentor for a double of what your mentor has. And the mentor said one last test. If you can see, you can become. 
you've got to see it to become it. You've got to see it in the realm of the spirit. Beloved, what are you seeing in the realm of the spirit? What are you seeing in the realm of the spirit? What do you see when you pray? There was a time in my life that I couldn't see beyond a day. There was a time in my life when everything was falling apart that I was unable to see beyond the day. I think somebody asked me the question and I said, I don't know because I can't see anything. I am overwhelmed with issues. I am overwhelmed with challenges. I am overwhelmed with problems. I am overwhelmed with immigration situation and being a single parent and trying to live a life that I was so overwhelmed. But a time came and I began to get the revelation that I can only become that which I see. And so I began to see in the realm of the spirit. And, and the more I began to see, the more I began to manifest, the more I began to hear because it says faith comes by hearing. And so I realized that I had to forge a deeper relationship with God. I had to remain immovable. And the very word that God says to me, I've got to apply that very word. Even though it looks like everyone is saying go left and God is saying go right. I've got to go right because I'm on a narrow path. Everyone might be on the broad way. Maybe people might call me stubborn um, because there were times when I was called stubborn um, because they couldn't see what I could see um, but I knew that God was taking me left um, and I'm like I'm gonna go um, I'm the only one on this path um, or I may have few people on this path um, but I've got to remain immovable and so you've got to go so what you see is what you become uh, beloved I want to challenge you what do you see what exactly do you see? What exactly do you see him? When they say Sienna, what do you see him? When they say Bethia, what do you see him? When they say Tendai, what do you see him? Oh, what do you see? What do you see? What do you see him? Because you can only become that which you see him. If your vision is not clear, let Jesus begin to change it again. We know of a certain man that was healed by Jesus. And Jesus said to him, now what do you see him? And he says, I see men as trees. Uh, walking they were he could not see clearly Jesus did not leave him in that state Jesus prayed over him and said now again what do you see him Jesus wants you to have a clarity of vision because he understand the power of vision because what you see is what you will become in the name of Jesus and we know when they crossed over the Jordan and they got to the other side um, and the chariots of horses came um, and came to take up Elijah. Elisha saw it and he says, my master, my master. And he began to speak for them because he saw and he began to speak it in the realm of the spirit. Um, he began to speak it in the physical. Um, and we know that instantly um, the mantle that Elijah carried um, fell down and Elisha was able to pick it up um, and he carried a double portion. Um, he went on to do great and mighty things. Um, even in death, he was powerful. We were told that a certain time um, over the, they were going to bury someone and the coffin of that person touched the tomb of Elijah um, and the dead body woke up um, and began to walk again. Um, that's what happens um, when you see right, um, when you hear right, um, when you confess right, um, when you remove, remain immovable um, in the things of God. Hallelujah, hallelujah, hallelujah. Beloved, I've come to an end, but I just want to leave you with a few quotations. You are here for a reason. Nothing has changed. And God has never changed his mind. God has never changed his mind about you. Before the foundation of this world, God had a plan for you. When he breathed into you the breath of life, he says, My daughter, Lorraine, my son, Paul, you will be a prophet unto the nations. God has never changed his mind. He will never change his mind. Don't judge yourself based on your environment. A lot of us are judging ourselves based on the environments that we are in. The statistics that we are given. Oh, a black child cannot do this. A white child cannot do this. A green child cannot do this. A mulatto child cannot do this. Because you come from here. Because you come from a dysfunctional family. Because your father died at this age. Because your mother did this. And because of this. We, we, the world is full of all manners of diagnosis. And, and all manners of statistics. And, but I want to tell you that I am not a product of my environment. You are not a product of your environment. We are children of God of the Most High. We are just passing through this world. I'm a resident of heaven and I am just going through this world. I am transitioning through this world. I am not of the world and I should not allow the world to begin to take over my focus and my attention in the name of Jesus. 
Don't judge yourself. Don't judge your God based on um, on what you see physically. Don't judge God. He is a spiritual God. It says that those that worship Him must worship Him in spirit and in truth. I cannot begin to 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 try and analyze my God based on physical things. Sometimes people will say, "But if God is God, why is there war?" That is not my business. I'm not going to judge my God based on what I see in the physical. Stop living within the confinement of your mind. Stop living within the confinement of your mind. What has God got concerning you? Don't let the enemy use your mind as a dumping ground. Ever since the foundation of this world, man, the enemy has always been wrestling for the minds of men. The minds of men. The enemy is ready and always playing mind games with you. Don't let the enemy be resident in your mind. Don't let him change your mind. Don't let him win over your mind. Don't let him. That is what Job did. He says, you can have it all. You can have my body, but you cannot have my mind in the name of Jesus. Stop living within the confinement of other people's minds and expectations. A lot of us are living life based on people's expectations. My mother wanted this. My father wanted this. My friend thought this would be better. This would happen. People talk to you and they say, oh, but so-and-so said that I should go into this business. And so-and-so said this would be. Stop living within the confinement of people. People will always try to place a confinement over you. We are told that there was a certain time in Israel where no one could lift up their head. Every time that they lift up their head, demonic horns will keep them down. The devil's plan is to keep you limited, restricted, and the embargoes and limitations and the intentions of God is for you to be free and be free and excel and fulfill everything. So stop living under the confinement of other people's mind and other people's expectations concerning you. I am better than my experience. A lot of us have had a number of experiences and we are allowing those experiences to dictate and define our life. I am better than my experiences in the name of Jesus. I am greater than I look. I am greater than I look. You may think that when you're looking at me, you're not looking at a queen, you're not looking at a princess, you're not looking at a leader, but I am better than I look. And I believe it, I walk in it, I process it, and that is what I will become in the name of Jesus. Live for something bigger than you can imagine. Live for something bigger than you can imagine. A lot of us are not able to get far because we are living for things that are not bigger. We are basing life based on our, our, on our myopic imaginations. But we must begin to live for something bigger than we can imagine. Everything begins with a thought. So I am one thought away from where I need to be. And so therefore I will change my thought. Everything begins with a thought. It comes into your mind and then you begin to manifest it. It begins to manifest in your spirit and then you begin to process it. So you are always one thought away from where you want to be. When God speaks to a man, he speaks at the speed of thought. And once you get that thought, you begin to manifest that thought. Don't throw away the thoughts that God has given you. Begin to build up those thoughts. And it is out of those thoughts that you will begin to manifest the very thing that God wants you to become. I serve a God whose name is Yea and Amen. Alpha and Omega. He is all-knowing and he will never ever forsake me and my life is in his hands. Hallelujah, hallelujah. Beloved, let us just stand on our feet and begin to give God praise and thank him for the word that has come to us at this time. Father, in the mighty name of Jesus, we thank you and we bless you. We glorify you in this place, Lord. We thank you for your word that has come to us, Lord. We thank you for every word that you have spoken to us, Lord. And now I ask, Lord, that the Holy Spirit will begin to manifest those words in our spirit. Father, we have spoken your word. I have brought out your word. And I pray that these words will begin to take root in the minds of your people. Someone will walk out of here and that very word will begin to be manifested in their life. That very word will begin to take root and shift them into greater places and into greater dimensions and into greater positions. In the name of Jesus, we thank you, Lord, and we bless you in Jesus' mighty name. Hallelujah. Hallelujah.